Hello everyone, this video is about the different manual cell counts using the hemocytometer together with sample problems and their computation. We will start with the general guidelines for manual cell counts and then proceed with sample problems for red blood cell count, white blood cell count, and the direct platelet count. The information from this video will mainly come from Rodax Hematology, but other principles from Brown, Steininger, and Turgeon are also adapted. The principle for manual cell counts is that the sample should first be diluted using diluting fluids and diluting pipettes. We call these pipettes as Thoma diluting pipettes. Once the sample has been diluted, it will be placed on a hemocytometer so that it can be read microscopically. Now, the principle remains the same whatever cell you are counting, either you're counting for white blood cells, red blood cells, or platelets. It may only vary in the dilution, the diluting fluid you are using, and the area that you should be counting. The manual cell count uses a chemocytometer or a counting chamber. The most common one is the Levy chamber that uses an improved Neubauer ruling. It is composed of two raised surfaces, one and two and each of these raised surfaces has a 3 mm by 3 mm square counting area. This would be chamber 1, and this at the bottom would be chamber number 2. These two raised surfaces where the chambers are located are separated by an H-shaped moat. If we look at it at a side view, the distance between the cover slip and the hemocytometer is 0.1 millimeter and this would be important in the computations to follow. If we are to magnify the counting area or the counting grid through the microscope, it will look like this and the grid is divided into nine large squares but we will not be using all of these squares or the complete grid for counting cells. It will depend on what kind of cells we intend to count. For white blood cells, we only count the cells inside the four large corner squares. If we are to count red blood cells, we only count the ones in the five secondary squares located in the central square. But if we count for platelets, we will be counting all the platelets found in the central square. Knowing the measurement of the grid is important for the computation of the area in the total cell count. The whole grid itself is 3 millimeters by 3 millimeters. That means each large square measures 1 millimeter each. The central large square is divided into 25 secondary squares, and each of these secondary squares measures 0.2 millimeter. There are two types of thomodiluting pipettes. We have the RBC pipette and the WBC pipette. Both of these pipettes can contain up to one unit of fluid inside their stems. One difference is that the RBC pipette is bigger, which can contain up to 100 units of fluid, while the WBC can only contain up to 10 units in its bulb. Because of this, the RBC pipette can perform higher dilutions. The total units for an RBC pipette is 101, while the total for the WBC is only 11. The first step in the manual cell counts is the dilution of the sample using the Thoma diluting pipettes. One of the purpose of dilution is to lessen the number of cells so that counting can be easier. So how does dilution happen with the pipettes? For example, we aspirate blood up to the 0.5 mark. So this is the white blood cell pipette. And after aspirating up to the 0.5 mark, we aspirate the diluting fluid and this will push the blood to the bulb of the pipette. 
The bead located inside the bulb will help in the mixing of the sample and the diluting fluid. The diluting fluid has a purpose of lysing the cells that are not needed for counting. So for example, we have this specimen and we only need to count white blood cells. The diluting fluid will then lice or remove the cells that are not needed like the red blood cells so we can end up with a sample preparation that only has the white blood cells which we are to count. There are diluting fluids that can also stain particular cell types like the Turks diluting fluid used for white blood cell counting that contains gentian violet and this can stain the nucleus of white blood cells. These are the following steps that we need to follow when using the hemocytometer for manual cell counting. First, we have to count cells from both chambers. It's important that these two chambers are used for counting and not just one. For white blood cells, we count the four large squares that are located at the corner. For RBCs, we count five secondary or the five intermediate squares, which is in the central square. And for platelets, we count the whole central square. After counting on both chambers, we now have to check if the cells are equally distributed between the squares. For examination purposes, we will be using Staininger for reference. For white blood cells, there should be no more than 15 cell difference. So for example, we have the counts of 25, 28, 30, and 32 on this chamber. To get the cell difference, we simply subtract the highest number and the lowest number, and we will have 7 as the cell difference. Now since 7 is not more than 15, that means the counts from this chamber can be accepted. For red blood cells, there should be no more than 20 cell difference. So for example, we have 5, 8, 10, 13, and 20. The process is the same. We just get the difference between the highest and the lowest count. So that's 20 minus 5 equals 15. And since 15 is not more than 20, the cells from this chamber or the counts from this chamber can be accepted. If, for example, the counts are more than 15 or more than 20, then you have to repeat the procedure and reload the hemocytometer. After checking for even cell distribution, we now have to compute for the acceptable difference between the chambers. There is a formula for this computation, which will be given later during the computation, and it should be within a 10% difference between the chambers. This, by the way, is according to Brown. After computing for the acceptable difference, and if it is within the 10% difference, then we have to compute for the total cell count. The formula for the total cell count will be given next. The following formula is used for the manual cell counts, whether you're counting for white blood cells, red blood cells or for platelets, we use the same formula. And this states that the number of cells counted is multiplied to the dilution factor and divided by the area counted multiplied to the depth. The number of cells counted is the average cell count from the two chamber, while the dilution factor is taken from the amount of blood and the amount of liquid in the bulb. So for white blood cells, again, we have 10, and for RBC, we use 100 for the bulb. The area counted will depend on how many squares you have counted, and the depth is a constant of 0 0.1 millimeter, which is the distance between the cover slip and the hemocytometer. Another formula given is also the number of cells multiplied to DCF multiplied to VCF. DCF is the dilution correction factor, which is the same as the dilution factor, while the VCF is the volume correction factor, which is the same as the area multiplied to the depth. 
Let's now proceed with sample computations for the red blood cell count. When counting red blood cells, we make use of the high power objective so that we can see the red blood cells clearly in the secondary square of the central square. This is how the red blood cells look like under LPO, and this is how they should look like under high power objective. For the diluting fluids, any of the following diluting fluids may be used for red blood cell count, with HAMs being the commonly used fluid. The diluting fluids for red blood cells are isotonic so that the RBC membrane may be preserved and the red blood cells will not lyse. For the dilution, the standard dilution for RBC is 1 is to 200. We prepare this by aspirating blood up to the 0 0.5 mark and aspirating diluting fluid up to the 101 mark. In cases of erythrocytosis or an increased number of red blood cells, we need to increase the dilution, and we do this by decreasing the amount of blood. We can either aspirate from 1, 2, 3, or 0.4 mark, and still aspirating diluting fluid up to the 101 mark. In cases of anemia, where there is a decreased amount of red blood cell, then we need to decrease the dilution to increase the amount of sample or specimen. We do this by increasing the amount of blood up to the one mark, and then aspirating fluid up to the 101 mark. This is our first example for the RBC count. Blood is aspirated up to 0 0.5 mark and filled with diluting fluid up to the 101 mark. Five secondary squares in each chamber were used in counting and the following counts were obtained. Chamber 1 has 412 cell counts and chamber 2 has 432 cell counts. If we are to follow the steps that were given earlier, the first step is to count the cells on both chambers, which was already given in the problem. The next step is to check if the cells are evenly distributed between the squares. But since the number of counts per square were not given, then we cannot validate for this. We just assume that they are acceptable and proceed to the next step. The third step is to compute for the acceptable difference between the chambers, and we have a formula to follow. The formula is that the difference between the two counts is divided by the average number of cells in both chambers multiplied to 100. To get the numerator, we just have to get the difference between the counts, so that's the bigger count minus the lower count, and we get 21 as the answer. For the denominator, we have to average the cells from both chambers. So that's 432 added to 412 divided by 2, and we should get the average count. We then continue with this formula until we get the answer of 4.98. As mentioned earlier, the acceptable difference is within 10%, and 4.98 is less than 10 making it an acceptable count. We can then proceed to the last procedure, which is to compute for the total cell count. The formula is as follows. The number of cells counted multiplied to the dilution factor divided by the area multiplied by the depth. The number of cells counted is the average from the two chambers. The dilution factor in this case is 200 because the amount of fluid in the bulb is 100 as given in the problem and the amount of blood is 0 0.5. 100 divided by 0.5 we can have the dilution. For the area counted it will depend on the number of squares counted. If we are counting five secondary squares, then the area is 0 0.2. For the depth, which is constant, that means it doesn't change. It's always 0 0.1. We continue with the formula. We will have an answer of 4,220,000 per cubic millimeter 
or we can also say it as 4.22 expansion 6 per microliter. Let's now have our second example for the RBC count. A decreased red blood cell was observed during the initial count for red cells, so the analyst have to repeat the procedure and made some adjustments to properly count the red cells. The following are the modifications done. Blood was drawn up to the 0.8 mark and was filled with diluting fluid up to the 101 mark. Five secondary squares are used in each of the chambers with an average of 189 cells. Chamber 1 has the following counts, 38, 35, 39, 42, and 40, and Chamber 2 has 30, 41, 38, 36, and 39. If you would like to try this sample on your own first, pause this video right now. If not, continue listening. To follow the steps given earlier, the first step is to count the cells on both chambers, and this is already a check since both counts from the chambers were already given. The next step is to check for the even distribution of cells between the squares, and we do this by subtracting the highest count with the lowest count on the first chamber, so that's 42 minus 35, and we will have 7, which is less than 20, which makes it acceptable. For the second chamber, we do the same, so that's 41, which is the highest count, minus 30, which is the lowest count, and we have a difference of 11, which is also acceptable. That means that the cells are evenly distributed in the chambers. Let's now proceed with the next step. So that is to compute for the acceptable difference between the chambers and we follow the formula. So the numerator is the difference between the two counts. The denominator is the average of the counts and we multiply this by 100 and we get 6.3% which is also within our acceptable difference limit of 10% making it acceptable so we can continue to the next step and that is to compute for the total cell count the number of cells counted is the average from the two chambers the dilution factor has now changed because we have changed the amount of blood so that means to compute for the dilution factor the amount in the bulb of an rbc pipette is 100 divided by 0.8 and we get 125 for dilution. The area is still 0.2 because we retained counting from the five secondary squares. The depth is still constant at 0.1. We follow the formula and we get 1,181,250 per cubic millimeter or 1.81 expansion six per microliter. Let's now continue with the second count, which is the white blood cell count. For the white blood cell count, we use the LPO or the low power objective for counting the cells. This is how white blood cells look like under LPO. So they are the small circular dots that you see. And this is how they look like under HPO. Now we use the LPO so that we can see the whole large square while we're counting, but if we use the HPO for counting itself, make sure that you do not go beyond the large square. For the diluting fluids, we can have 2-3% to acetic acid, 1% hydrochloric acid, and Turk's solution, which has a dye for staining the nucleus of the white blood cell. For the dilution, the standard dilution for white blood cell is 1 is to 20 using the WBC pipette. We do this by aspirating blood up to the 0.5 mark and the diluting fluid up to the 11 mark. The dilution is taken by dividing the amount of fluid in the bulb, which is 10 divided by 0.5, and we should get 20. In cases of conditions where the white blood cell count is more than 30 per 
uh, microliter, then we can increase the dilution up to 1 is to 100. We do this by aspirating blood up to the 1 mark and then the diluting fluid up to the 101 mark. That means we use the RBC pipette because this can have an increased dilution of 100. If the white blood cell count is higher, like in some cases of leukemia where it can be 100 to 300 uh, expansion 3 per microliter, then we can still increase the dilution up to 1 is to 200. So that would be blood up to the 0 0.5 mark and the diluting fluid up to the 100 mark, 101 mark so that we can have a dilution of 100 divided by 0 0.5 and that will be 200. For our first exercise for white blood cell count, a dilution of 1 is to 20 was used for a white blood cell count performed in four large corner squares. 96 and 102 cells were counted on the two chambers of the hemocytometer. The question is, is the difference between the two chambers acceptable? If you want to try this exercise on your own first, pause the video. If not, let's continue. The first step is to count cells on both chambers, which is a check since 96 and 102 cells were given. The next step is to check if the cells are evenly distributed between the squares. But since the number of counts per square were not given, then we cannot validate for this. So we proceed with the next step, which is to compute for the acceptable difference between the chambers. The numerator is the difference between the two counts, so that's the bigger count minus the smaller count, so that's 6. And we get the denominator by computing for the average, so that's 96 plus 102 divided by 2, and we get the denominator. We continue with the formula and we get an answer of 0.06%, which is within our acceptable limit of 10%. And to answer the question, it is yes, they are acceptable. Let's proceed with the counting of the total cell count so that we use the same formula. The cells counted is the average, which is 99, and the dilution is 20, which is already given in the problem and then the area is four millimeters because we have used four large corner squares for counting and this is i'm sorry this is a typographical error it should be 0 0.1 millimeter which is a constant for the depth we continue with the formula we have an answer of 4950 per cubic millimeter or 4.95 expansion 3 per microliter. This is now our second exercise for the white blood cell count. Blood was drawn up to the one mark of an RBC Thoma pipette with the diluting fluid drawn up to the 101 mark. This indicates that maybe the patient has an increased WBC count. That's why an increased dilution was needed since the RBC pipette was used. A white blood cell count was performed using this sample by counting all WBCs in all primary squares. So that means nine large squares were used since all primary squares were used on both chambers for counting. 284 and 302 cells were counted from the two chambers. So if you want to compute for this, kindly pause the video first. If not, let's continue. So the first step is to count the cells on both chambers and we have two counts. Chamber one has 284 and chamber two has 302. The next step is to check for the cell distribution between the squares. Again, the specific counts per square were not given so we cannot validate. But if we are to validate for white blood cell, they should not be more than 15. No more than 15 cells per square. The next step is to compute for the acceptable difference between the chambers. The difference between two counts, so that's 302 minus 284, we have 18. And then the denominator, which is the average, is 293. 
we then have 6.14%, which is still within our 10% limit. If, for example, we have a result which is more than 10%, then we have to repeat the procedure because that means the cells were not evenly distributed between the chambers. But since our count is acceptable, let's now proceed with our total cell count computation. For the cells counted, this is the average, 293. Dilution now is 100, since 100 is the amount of fluid in the bulb, divided by the amount of blood, which is 1, we get 100 as the dilution. The area is now changed to 9, since 9 squares were used, as indicated by the sample, when it was mentioned that all primary squares were used. This is still a constant of 0 0.1 millimeter. We do the computation. We'll have 32,555.56 per, per cubic millimeter or 32.56 expansion 3 per microliter. And for our last count is the platelet count. For the platelet count, using the hemocytometer, we use the high power objective for counting, like what we did in red blood cells, but this time we have to count the cells in the whole central large square. This is how platelets would look like under the LPO, and this is how the platelets would look like under the high power objective. For the diluting fluids, we can either use 1% ammonium oxalate or the recent ecker diluting fluid. The standard dilution for platelet is 1 is to 100. We do this by aspirating blood up to the 1 mark and the diluting fluid up to the 101 mark. We use an RBC pipette, so that's up to the 1 mark, and the diluting fluid up to the 101 mark. If, for example, the cells in each chamber or in each side is more than 500. So that means this is the count in one large central square, since we only count one square per side. So if there's more than 500 cells in each chamber, then we need to increase the dilution to one is to 200. We do this by aspirating blood of 0.5 mark and the diluting fluid up to the 101 mark. But for example, there is a decreased number of cells, we then have to decrease the dilution. So for example, we have less than 50 cells per side or per chamber. The dilution we use is 1 is to 20 by using the WBC pipette. So we aspirate blood up to the 0.5 mark and the diluting fluid up to the 11 mark. For our first exercise for platelet count, using a 1 is to 100 dilution, a direct platelet count was performed by counting all the platelets in the large central square. 289 and 303 cells were counted on the two chambers. If you want to compute by yourself, kindly pause the video. If not, let's continue. The first step is to count the cells on both chambers. So we have chamber 1, which is 289, and chamber 2, which is 303. Our next step is to check for the even cell distribution between the squares. But since in platelet count, we only count one square, which is the central square per chamber, then there is no other square to compare it with within the chamber. So this may not be applicable. And there were no references given by our reference book. So let's proceed with our third step, which is to compute for the acceptable difference between the chambers. Our numerator is the average between the counts, so that's 303 minus 289, and we will have 14. The denominator is the average, which is 296, and we will have a difference of 4.73, which is acceptable because it is within 10%. Our next step then is to compute for the total cell count. We still use the same formula. The cells counted is the average, which is 296, multiplied to the dilution, which is given in the problem. 
and then the area is one millimeter square because only one central or one large square was used for counting. The depth is still a constant of 0 0.1 millimeter. We follow the formula and we will have 296,000 per cubic millimeter. This is our last exercise for the platelet count. Blood is drawn up to the one mark of the Thoma RBC pipette with the diluting fluid drawn up to the 101 mark. A platelet count was performed on both sides with 88 and 82 platelets in each of the five intermediate squares. Please pause the video and compute on your own first and play it again when you're done. Let's continue. The first step is to count the cells on both chambers. So we have 88 on chamber 1 and 82 on chamber 2. The next step is to check for the even cell distribution between the squares. But as we have mentioned earlier, only one central square was used so we cannot compare it with any other square. So this is not applicable. Let's now proceed with our third step which is to compute for the acceptable difference of the chambers. The numerator is the difference between the two counts, so we have to subtract 88 minus 82, so we'll have 6. The denominator is the average of the two counts, which is 85, and we'll have a difference of 7.05%, which is acceptable because it is still within 10%. For examination purposes, on all manual counts, up to 10.9% will be accepted. Let's now proceed with our last step, which is to compute for the total cell count. This is the same for all of the manual cells count that we have been performing. The cells counted on the numerator is the average count of the uh, cells, so that's 85. The dilution is now 100 because of the given facts on the problem. So the bulb of an RBC pipette is 100 divided by the amount of blood used, which is 1. That is why we have a dilution of 100. For the area, which is 0 0.2, because we only used 5 intermediate squares. But for example, if we have used the whole central square, as we should use for platelet, then our area would be 1 millimeter square. For the depth, which is constant, at 0 0.1 millimeter. After computation, we'll have a platelet count of 425,000 per cubic millimeter. And that is all for this video. Hope you understand the computations for the manual cell counts using the hemocytometer. Thank you very much for watching.